We're looking at the end of this series. We've been talking about the book of Romans, and we've been kind of uh, walking through this step by step, and we've been taking chunks at times and then slowing down and covering uh, the same part of that uh, a little more in depth. And, and so today, as we wrap up the series, this is going to be the end of the series. I think it's the longest series we've ever done. I think it's about week 11 or something. Uh, and uh, we've had a great time reading Romans and, uh, and just kind of letting that saturate. We've encouraged you to read it over and over again, and hopefully you have. Uh, and I was thinking, okay, so how do we wrap this up? Most of Romans is, there's a lot of doctrine. Paul uh, pours out a lot of doctrine for us in the book of Romans and tells us how the church should be following the guidelines that God has. A lot of it, he's trying to reconcile Jews and Gentiles and getting them to work together and understand that this gospel is for everybody. And, and there's a lot of that. And then chapter 16, really, it's just a long goodbye. He, he's just signing off and greeting a lot of different people. And so I was thinking, well, where do we land this plane then? Where, where would be a good spot to, to wrap up this series? And as I was reading through it again, I, I saw verse 13 in chapter 15, Romans 15, 13. I thought, you know, that, that's the perfect place. That's the perfect place to put the bow on it, so to speak. And, you know, we've been, uh, Pastor Trav and I have been assigning one-word titles to these. Um, and for this, for this week, as we wrap it up, the one word is hope. Hope. How many of you think that in a world that we're living in, hope might be a good thing to have? And, and I didn't do this in the first gathering, and it's always a little clumsy because you always have that overachiever that wants to read way too fast. But uh, I think maybe it'd be good if we just read this verse together. Do you think we could do that? And then everybody kind of pace themselves. And uh, we don't do that often around here, but I think it'd be kind of cool to do that. It's not that long. Uh, and I want you to read it along with me. So let's just read it out loud. Remember, there's no bonus points for finishing early, okay? <laughs> so just stay with us, okay? Here we go. You ready? I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Boy, you guys are good. That, was, that blessed my heart. That really did. I love to hear that. You know, we're going to just kind of take this passage, this one verse, we're going to do an expository message on just this verse. Usually you do more than one verse, but today we're just going to park there for a few minutes, and I want to, I just kind of want to walk through some of the high points of this and underline some things for you. We did it in the slide, and I want you to focus on those things as we look at it again. I pray that God, the source of hope, source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow. This is so good. I'm, I can't wait to unpack this for you because it's kind of cool when you look at it. With confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, everything we're doing here is prefaced on the fact uh, that, or predicated, you might say, on the fact that we do this through the Holy Spirit's power. We can't do this on our own. We've tried that, didn't work. Uh, you know, even the best efforts just don't, just don't happen, right? It's, when we have big time needs, we need more than just what we can muster. And that, that whole, hey, just pull yourself up from your bootstrap. By the way, that's not scripture. Uh, you know, some people, no, seriously, some people quote a lot of things and say it's scripture. No, it's just something you've heard for years. It might even be good, but it's not scripture. But here's what I want to tell you. We can't do that. We cannot, we don't have the ability to pull ourselves up from our bootstraps, so to speak, whatever that means. We don't have that. We need the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Amen. It's only through his power that we accomplish the things I'm about to share with you. We've had, um, we've had some exposure this week, and, and trust me, this is, it's going to sound like it's political, but it's not, okay? We've had some exposure this week to 
uh, a couple of presidents talking. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. I'm trying to be careful here. Uh, there's more than one time I agreed with President Trump. I said, not sure just what he said. But, um, but today I want to tell you something. We're going to put all that aside because we're not going to talk about either one of those guys. And, and here's, here's what I want to remind you. We're talking about hope. Well, my hope is not built. It's not built on who occupies the White House. It never has been. And, and I want to tell you today that as we look at that passage of Scripture, we talk about the hope that fills us. And we're going to get deeper into that in just a moment, but it's more than just fills us, but I mean is filling and overflowing us. That hope comes from deep within through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I want you to think about this question because I'm going to ask you this. And I want you to think about it for a minute because I've got a little story to tell you while you're thinking about it. But where does your hope come from? Where does your hope come from? You know, we, uh, I was going to say, you know, we've, we've looked for hope in all the wrong places. And the minute I say that, there's a song that comes to your mind, right? So we might as well just get it out. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, we can sing it different. We say, looking for hope in all the wrong places. Listen, it's true, isn't it? We've looked for hope in, uh, let's take a uh, real quick inventory. We looked for hope in money, and that didn't give us. If that, was, if that was it, then there's a lot of billionaires and trillionaires that would be very filled with hope. They're not, you know. We've looked for it in fame. That didn't help us. Well, not us, but I'm saying, you know, generally speaking, if, if fame is what brings hope, then why do some of those folks, you know, and I'm not going to get morose, but why do some of those folks end their own lives? Because they didn't have hope. They had all the fame. But they didn't have hope. We look for hope in, in positions and power. That's the saddest thing about this last week in my estimation as a Red-blooded American looking forward to celebrating Independence Day later this week. I am greatly saddened. I am greatly saddened by the fact that somebody or group of somebodies would push somebody out on a stage and do what we saw happen this week. And I'm just, I'm going to say that's all I'm going to, I'm not going to dig into it, but I'm just saying it's a sad day when we're trying to hold on to power that bad. And power doesn't bring hope. It doesn't bring hope. Uh, speaking of presidents, I am old enough that my favorite president of all time was Ronald Reagan. And, and some of you may agree. I, I, I've liked a couple of them. I liked George W. Bush until he decided to break his word. And he said he would never talk about his successors. And then he didn't until he did. And... Uh, when somebody beat up his brother, then he started talking about him. But you know what I'm saying? It's like there, all these guys have had their great moments, but Ronald Reagan for me is one of those guys that least suspected he would be the statesman that he was. But he said some great things. I have a whole page. I have a whole page in my office of sayings that, that Ronald Reagan uh, said or were quoted by. And, and he, there were some great ones. One of them, he said, I, I shudder to think what the Ten Commandments would look like if it was run through Congress. <laughs> he also said, while, as a sitting president, he said, the most fearful words you can hear is, I'm here, from the, I'm here to help, and I'm from the government. <laughs> he said a lot of great, say, my favorite one of all time, my favorite one of all time, he said this, he said, it's, this really, it really applies better today than it did when he said it. He said, it's not that our liberal friends are ignorant. It's just that they know so many things that aren't true. <laughs> and when you think about it, you got to say, you know what, I think you might have been on to something there. 
And we're not talking Democrat and Republican, because, you know, there's, that's one line that we draw, but there's a lot of us. And we're not going to get into that today. But somebody asked him one time, I think it was Edwin Meese that was on his, part of his cabinet, uh, was quoted as saying that he asked him one time, because he'd heard him tell a lot of stories. You know, Ronald Reagan was a storyteller. Uh, and, oh, by the way, one, one of my favorite sayings of him, too, is when he told the then ruler of the Russian world, this wall has to come down. This wall that separated East and West Germany. But you know what? Somebody asked him one time, what are your, what's your favorite story? Because he was constantly telling stories. And he said, this is my favorite story. I'm not going to, I could read it. I have the, the transcript here. I'm not going to do that. But let me just, for the sake of time, let me sort of encapsulate it, shorten it a little bit. He said, my favorite story was uh, the one about the, the twin five-year-olds. Two, these parents had twin five-year-olds, and one of them was a complete pessimist, and the other was a complete optimist. And so they, they didn't know how to reconcile these two personalities, so they took these children to a psychiatrist to say, help us figure out what's going on with our kids. I mean, they were polar opposites in their personalities. The psychiatrist took the pessimistic child and, and took him down the hall to a room that he'd packed full of brand new toys from floor to ceiling, brand new toys, took him to the door, said to the pe pessimistic five-year-old, go ahead and go in there and have fun. And the kid started bawling. And he looked at him and he said, what's the matter? And he said, I'd go in there and do that, but I'd probably just break them all. And so saddened by that, the psychiatrist took him back to the room and grabbed the, the optimist brother and said, hey, come on with me. I want to show you something. He took him to a different room. Now, I'm a plumber's kid, so I'm going to dress it up a little bit and use different words than we may have heard at our house. But uh, he took him to a room that was floor to ceiling horse manure. He opened the door, and that optimist kid climbed up, <laughs> climbed up to the top of that pile and started digging furiously, laughing and giggling the whole time. And the psychiatrist said, hey, wait a second. Hold on. What are you doing? He said, with all this manure in here, there's got to be a pony somewhere. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm digging through stuff sometimes in this world, don't you? And there's a pony in there. Hope. Hope. Where does your hope come from? Like I said, we've looked in a lot of places without great success. The prophet Isaiah said it this way. I love what he said. He says in, in Isaiah 40, verse 26, it says this. There it is. Look up to the heavens. We could just start with those first two words. Look up. We spend so much time with our head down, butting our head into wall or other people or other things because we are looking down so much of the time. I got news for you. I can save you some headache. And you know what that is? The, the answer is not down here. The pony is not down here. We have to look up. He said, look up into the heavens. Look, look at the way he describes the creator God who we place our hope and trust in. Look up to the heavens. Who created, all, who created all these stars? He asked that question. Who created all these stars? And he says, he, God, brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each of them by its name. Scientists think they've named these stars. Hey, guess what? They had a name before they got around to it. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Think about that. Who's the source of hope that you have today? I'm telling you, if it's in things and people and situations, look up. It reminds me of another passage of scripture. It says, when, you know, and this is where we live right now. This is where we live today. We live in a hopeless culture. I'm not trying to be down. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it the way I see it. We live in a hopeless culture. 
Everybody blames everybody. Nobody wants to take responsibility. And we keep looking around and looking down and we keep bumping into stuff because we refuse to look up. The Bible says this, in the last days you're going to see wars and rumors of wars, famine, earthquake, all these natural disasters. What does he say? Lift up your head because your redemption draws nigh. Your hope is not in this. The old song we used to sing, my hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. That's the truth. Well, let, look at what the scripture said. Our text this morning says, and let it fill you completely. Fill you completely. When you look at that passage there, that phrase, in the Greek, literally means, literally means to make replete. That's a word we don't use very often. But replete or to cram. That's the actual definition of the Greek word here. To cram. This, when we look to the God of hope, our source of hope, he's going to cram us completely full of joy and peace. Joy and peace. He's going to literally pack our lives with joy and peace. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, if we're crammed full of joy and peace that comes from the Father of hope, then we have no room for doubt and fear and anxiety, stress. You see, the answer, and I'm going to pause for just a second. That's where we want to be on the PowerPoint, Dan. Thank you. But I want to pause just a second and say this, that we, and I didn't do this in the first gathering. Maybe I should but when we are crammed full of the hope that God has for us, there's not room for these other elements. So the answer, if your life is stressed, if your li life is full of fear, if your life is filled with anxiety, if your life is full of stress, or uh, I said that already, stress, but anger and frustration, all you pick the negative emotion. If your life is filled with that, the answer is not to look for somebody to take it out. Listen to what I'm saying. The answer isn't for somebody to take that out. The answer is to fill it up, your life, so much with the hope of Jesus that there's no room for those things. Let him cram your life full of joy and peace. See, in the English language, we have such limited uh, verbiage and, and phraseology that uh, sometimes we use the same words for different things. You know, we talk about loving our dog, loving chocolate, loving our spouse, loving, you know. We, we throw these words around because we're somewhat limited in the English language. Uh, and in this case, it's easy to look at this and say, oh yeah, that's, that'd be cool, joy and peace, who doesn't want that? Well, it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that. When he says joy and peace, what he's talking about, the literal meaning here of joy is calm delight. Wow, that's, that's, let's just let that happen for a second. Take a deep breath and just let calm delight. Wow, wouldn't that be nice? In a world where we can't wait a minute and a half for our burger to come through the window. In a world where we get anxious because we have so many places to be, so little time to get there. He's promising calm delight. I don't know about you, but that sounds terribly appealing to me. You know, I was trying to think, so what would be an image or a picture, a mental image I could create? For me, this calm delight is watching my grandkids play. Because the beauty of it is, if they get ornery, I just take them back to their parents. <laughs> Which they rarely do, but the parents get ornery, but no, no, I'm just joking. No, they don't either. But it's just that, you know, what? It, or maybe you don't have grandkids, or maybe kids are, or maybe just sitting by a tranquil uh, stream running by your campsite, when you just sit there and it's just like, this is how it's supposed to be. This is how it's supposed to be. That's the joy that he's 
promising to not just give us a little bit, but to cram our lives full of that calm delight. How about that peace, that prosperity, not in the sense of getting rich. See, when we read prosperity, we immediately think, cha-ching, we, we, we're thinking money or possessions. That's not really what this is. It is, but, but from a different angle, what he's really saying there is you can have calm delight because you don't lack anything. You don't lack anything. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Psalm 23. He maketh me to lie down. That's the one I like. Mark, you remember hearing that? He makes us lie down. Why does it say that? Because given, just left to our own devices, we, we won't lay down. But he said, you need to just stop for a minute. I want to put calm delight. I want you to understand you don't lack anything and I'm going to make you lie down in green pastures. I want to restore your soul. It says we are filled completely. We're crammed full of joy and peace. Why? Because we trust in him. Because we trust in him. I want to ask you another question today. What are you trusting in? The Bible makes it clear. It says the arm of flesh will fail us, meaning leaning on our own devices. I know a little bit more about trust than I used to. This last uh, 16 months or so, is, if it hasn't taught me anything, it's taught me that I need to learn to trust people. Before, uh, by the way, if you saw the social media with me climbing those steps, that was in Rio. That's in the gym in Rio where I was walking up and down, that Rio is not, I wish it was in South America, but it's not. I'm talking about Rio, Rehabilitation Institute of Oregon in, in the upper floors of Good Sam Hospital. And, uh, and where I go for uh, therapy is in a couple buildings over. And, and my therapist said, let's go over there and let's see, because she had me doing it on the parallel bars. She goes, that's way too easy. We got to get you on something harder. And so uh, we went over on a field trip, she called it, and we got on the practice stairs that you saw in the video. And, uh, and as I was walking up and down those, it occurred to me, it occurred to me that those mats, well, they call them mats, but they're like exam tables. Those mats that were in the opposite corner from where I was walking up and down those stairs to where I used to lay, unable to transmit myself from this chair to, well, that chair, to the mat and back. I had to be taken to the mat. I had to be taken off the mat. I couldn't even lift my arms. And I would look at that staircase. And I'd watch other people stumbling up and down that staircase thinking, will I ever get there? But I got news for you. There really is a pony down in there. Because <laughs> as I walked up and down those steps, don't think for a minute it wasn't going through my head. I used to be where that guy over there is that's having to be helped on and off that mat. That used to be me. And now God is restoring that hope, that hope that he has everything under control in his timing. What are we trusting in? I had to learn to trust in people that said they would care for me. It wasn't that I didn't trust them, but it's scary when you can't move your arms or legs and then they say, we're going to sit you up. Oh, really? I was never so petrified to see a tile floor in my life because it felt like if they lose control, I'm going to be there in just a minute. I learned to trust I learned to trust in him completely. It says we do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, he said, and this is not on there on the slides, but Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send a comforter. Some translations say comforter, others say helper. But in the Greek, it's the word paraclete, which means literally to come alongside and hold up. 
David, the writer of the Psalms, says this in Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We will trust in the name of the Lord our God. In the name of Jesus, we have conquering power. In the name of Jesus, we can have peace in the midst of the storm. In the name of Jesus, we can have assurance and hope that he's going to come through for us. In Proverbs, verse 18, and I'm going to have the worship team come because we're going to sing a song here in a moment. Pastor Trav last week pulled out a golden oldie, so it's my turn today. I'm going to, I'm going to reach back and grab one, and we're going to sing on the way out today. But Proverbs 18, 10 says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. There's times I couldn't even speak yet. But I was thinking as loudly as I could, if that makes sense to you. Jesus. 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 The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Look at what it says. The godly run into him and are safe. We don't stand and fight on the outside. We run into the name of the Lord and he protects us. He strengthens us. How does he do that? By the overflow of confident hope, the scripture says, that he pours into our lives. To a superabound is the definition in the Greek there. When it says to overflow with confident hope, it says to superabound or to in excess have confident hope. What is confident hope? Again, I was thinking, because I, like I like to think in terms of word pictures in my mind. It helps me to really identify what I'm working through. And, and uh, Jamie and Patty are going to know this is the minute I say his name. Uh, but as a kid, I had the privilege, and it really was a privilege, uh, to have, and I don't know that this has ever happened that I know of, but uh, a pastor named Albert Carroll Grimes, or he went by the name A.C. Grimes, and I'm telling you, if there ever was a stud, it was A.C. Grimes. I mean, when your name is A.C., you're, that's just like pretty cool all by itself, isn't it? Dude was a, he worked for the railroad before he went into the ministry. Big barrel chested guy, deep baritone voice. I wish I had a picture. I have one somewhere buried in my pictures. I couldn't get it out fast enough to show you today. But He was my pastor when I was first born. His wife had a letter that I wrote to her when I was a couple days old. Obviously, my mom. Some of you are like, how did you do that? <laughs> then he went away for a while, and he came back and pastored the church again. And I had the tremendous, and I counted a tremendous privilege when he sort of retired. He came back to that church when I was on staff there myself, and we got to be on staff together. I felt like I had gotten voted into the Hall of Fame. Because this guy, Jamie, you guys remember, Patty, you remember. He had a faith like none other. And, I, and I'm not going to lie, I don't know how much of my faith was in him as a kid or in God because he just represented that persona that when he touched heaven, things happened. I've watched him pray for people and they just got healed. And it's like, how does that happen? As a kid, you know, you're trying to process all that. I'm somewhat embarrassed to tell you that I got sick one day, I think. I think I actually just wanted to stay home and play with my cars. But I told my mom I was sick and I couldn't go to school because I'm not feeling very good. My mom, being the brilliant woman that she was, saw right through it. She knew how to cure that. She said, that's okay. I'm going to call Pastor Grimes. I thought, well, I liked him good enough, but I knew what was going to happen. So he shows up and walks into my bedroom and lays those big hands on me and prays for me. And then, almighty God, touch Doug. 
and Zeke's praying for him. I thought, this is over. Well, he left the room, and my mom said, of course, she had some goodies that she wanted to give him and, and coffee to serve him, and that's what you did back in the day, you know. And so he was sitting there drinking his coffee. I don't remember this, Fatty, or, but I was told from the time I, I, apparently right after it happened until my mom passed away, I would hear the story over and over and over. Apparently, I got dressed, got out of bed, got dressed, made my way to the living room and said, well, we better go to school. And, and my mom looked at me and she said, what happened? And my words, apparently, I don't remember this, but she said, I looked at her, looked at him and said, well, he did it again. <laughs> the faith. What was it? It wasn't that deep baritone voice that shook heaven. It wasn't that relentless faith that he had and embodied that we saw even as kids recognize this is something special. But it was our hope in an almighty God that answers prayer. And I want to ask you today, what is it that you're looking for? Are you looking for hope today? Well, it's to be found. But not where you're looking. Hope comes in surrender. Before we sing this song, I want to I wanna take just a moment because we will tell you that we don't waste any opportunities around here. At Crossroads, if you come to church, you're going to hear the gospel. Here you go. Here you go. We, we were sinners. We are sinners when we come to him and we need a savior we can't get there on our own the bible says what the blood of bulls and goats those sacrifices couldn't accomplish Jesus did on the cross he who knew no sin Jesus became sin for us why? so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ he loved us enough to come and give his life on the cross for us the bible says that whoever believes in him will never perish, but have everlasting life. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess, he forgives. So I want to invite you today, if you have never made that step, in these next few moments as we sing a song and as we kind of worship him for a moment, if you've never made that step, please do just say, Jesus, I'm tired of chasing hope in all the wrong places. I need you to help me. Lean into him today. Lean into him today. He'll take care of you.